Om Ajnati Madandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Nena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha which is Canto number 8. Chapter is number 2. And today's verse is number 31. Itam Itam Vijendraha Vijendraha Sa Yidapa Yidapa Sankatam Sankatam Itam Vijendra Sa Yidapa Sankatam Itam Vijendra Pranasya, Pranasya, Dehi, Dehi, Vibhasho, Vibhasho, Yadrichaya, Yadrichaya, Pranasya Dehi, Vibhasho, Yadrichaya, Pranasya Dehi, Vibhasho, Yadrichaya, Aparanyam, Aparanyam, Aparya, excuse me, Aparayan, 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 And, and, and 
being embodied, and being embodied, and circumstantially helpless, and circumstantially helpless, could not save himself from danger. Could not save himself from danger. He was extremely afraid of being killed. He was extremely afraid of being killed. He consequently thought for a long time. He consequently thought for a long time. And finally reached the following decision. And finally reached the following decision. Purported by His Divine Grace A. C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. Shri Prabhupada Ki. Everyone in the material world is engaged in a struggle for existence. Everyone tries to save himself from danger, but when one is unable to save himself, if he is pious, he then takes shelter of the lotus feet of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. This is confirmed in Bhagavad Gita 7.16. Chaturvita bhajante mam jana sukritinarjana arto jignaso artarti Nyanicha Pratarshapa. Four kinds of pious men, namely one who is in danger, one who is in need of money, one who is searching for knowledge, and one who is inquisitive, begin to take shelter of the Supreme Personality of Godhead in order to be saved or to advance. The king of the elephants, in his condition of danger, decided to seek shelter of the lotus feet of the Lord. After considerable thought, he intelligently arrived at this correct decision. What was the correct decision? To take shelter of God. Correct. Such a decision is not reached by a sinful man. Therefore, in Bhagavad Gita, it is said that those who are pious, Sukriti, can decide that in a dangerous or awkward condition, one should seek shelter of the lotus feet of Krishna. So, the word interestingly used in this verse, Yadrishchaya, is uh, translated as by the will of providence. Sometimes it's word, Yadrishchaya means things which come of their own accord without you asking for them. So, <clears throat> Prabhupada mentions in one of his purports I just read, that when people get things that they want, they um, accept it as the will of the Lord, but when they get things that they don't want, it's hard to reconcile. And they think, why do bad things happen to good people like me? Prabhupada elaborates that when good things happen to impious people, they think, what do I need God for? Because I'm so smart, I get, I get so much such good result because of my intelligence. And when they get bad things, they say there can't be a God because he's uh, unjust and immoral because he's torturing me for no reason. And when devotees get something good, they say, I didn't deserve this, but it's the Lord's special mercy. And when something bad happens to them, they say, I deserved much more, <laughs> but the Lord's given me only a token. And <clears throat> in this verse, it's, uh, I particularly noted that Gajendra has made the correct decision. That means there's a decision to make at a particular point during the hard struggle for existence, which Prabhupada notes in the first line of the purport, everyone in the material world is engaged in a struggle for existence. And during that struggle for existence, Yadrishchaya, by the will of Providence, certain um, difficulties will come to one unsought. One uh, incident happened in my life recently in some management uh, episode where there was a, uh, well, there was a lawsuit that uh, came of its own accord, Didrish Jaya. And somehow or other, because I was attached to the management, it also got attached to me. And I wasn't accustomed to such a thing happening. And it was, it was a pretty severe case. And I, I worried about it a lot. It was actually against you know, an ISKCON property. And I was uh, quite concerned about it for a long time, wondering what to do, what to do. And I, I met with some God brothers, senior God brothers, one day when I was in anxiety because I thought, this is a good idea to talk to your God brothers and say, what's on your mind? So I told them, you know, everything's going okay, except I'm in complete anxiety and I can't sleep. Other than that, everything's fine. And uh, they said, what's the reason? So I explained it to them. They said, oh, that is pretty serious. 
and so forth. And they, they gave me a little solace. I was about 13% better when I left. But then one of the God brothers sent me about five days later a verse that not only took away all my anxiety, but solved all the all my problems in life. Would you like to know what the verse was? Yes. Oh, sorry, I can't remember. No, no. Just kidding. So it's in the it's in the Srimad Bhagavatam, just as I'm saying what it is, our one of our resident pundits who's just getting up from his seat will go and get it. Probably even knows which one I'm going to say. From the fourth canto, there's a section uh, regarding Prithu Maharaj performing horse sacrifices. Apparently, it's a very prestigious thing to do because it takes a lot of money and uh, a lot of effort to put on one horse sacrifice. Indra had put on a hundred, so he's famous all throughout the universe. That who could have done a hundred horse sacrifices? And Prithu Maharaj, an incarnation of the Lord performed 99 and was on his 100th. And on the 100th heart sacrifice, Indra said, wait, hold it, hold it. Mm -hmm. And he came down dressed as a sannyasi, which is where the, the beginning of all the bogus sannyasis, sannyasi uh, lines came into existence. He was the origin of them. So he came down dressed as a sannyasi to steal away the horse from the sacrifice. And he grabbed the horse, took it away, and said, well, it's a sannyasi, we can't do anything. And, then the son of Prithu Maharaj chased after him and realized he was a, wasn't a real sannyasi. But nonetheless, he was afraid to kill him, but Indra uh, got away with the son of Prithu, brought the horse back, and then Indra came again and again. Three times he stole away the horse. He really ruined the sacrifice. And Prithu became so disturbed, because this was his service, and this was a vital sacrifice he was performing. And at that time, Lord brought, he wanted to kill Indra. Ever feel like that? <laughs> Probably. Thank you. He wanted to kill Indra, and Brahma came to uh, intervene. And Brahma said, if you got the right verse, my dear king, <clears throat> do not be agitated and anxious because your sacrifices have not been performed, excuse me, my dear king, do not be agitated and anxious because your sacrifices have not been properly executed due to providential impediments. Kindly take my words with great respect. We should always remember that if something happens by providential arrangement, we should not be very sorry. The more we try to re rectify, the more we try to rectify such reversals, the more we enter into the darkest region of materialistic thought. Did you get it? Yeah. You feel better? Here's the purple one. Sometimes the saintly or very religious person also has to meet with reversals in life. Such incidents should be taken as providential. Although there may be sufficient cause for being unhappy, one should avoid counteract counteracting such reversals for the more we become implicated in rectifying such reversals, the more we enter into the darkest regions of material anxiety. Lord Krishna has also advised us in this connection. We should tolerate things instead of becoming agitated. So when I read that verse, Ritadvar Swami sent it to me. He, he, uh, he knew that I was in anxiety. He read the verse. He sent it to me. He said, here, I think this will help. And it did immensely. I read that first. It was like medicine that I took that acted immediately. And I just followed the advice in the verse, which was to not try to rectify the system, just do my duty, dutifully, do whatever could, uh, could be possibly done, and leave the rest to providence, because it had come uh, without me asking, and uh, it was out of my hands what I could do about it. So now, um, in this verse, we're at a juncture and, and very intimate, uh, we have a very intimate view into the mindset of a, of a devotee, Gajendra, and how he processes what happens to him during his life. So he's been captured by the crocodile. And after the puppet show last night, when Tushta was walking home, he was a little afraid because he was thinking maybe a crocodile would come out from any corner 
right, Dushka? He came home and he said, Phew, I just made it. So I was thinking, at any, at any step, a crocodile would come out from the bushes and grab my leg. So Gajendra now, he's been trapped for a thousand years in fighting, and this is the point at which he has to make a decision. A decision means to say, I'm going to do this. This is what I'm finally going to do. And this is a relief, because actually suffering comes from not knowing what to do and being uncertain. Sometimes people get a disease and they're not sure what it is. They don't have a diagnosis, and therefore they really suffer mentally because they're not sure what's happening to them. But once somebody tells them, well, you're going to die in three months, then you know it's a lot easier to deal with because you just, all right, that's it. I have three months to live. And then you, you just do what you have to do within three months. So Gajender now is at this point where he realizes I'm in, I'm in a precarious situation and I can't win. And now he makes the decision which is uh, mentioned by Srila Prabhupada. He says, after considerable thought, considerable thought, this shows that when these things happen to us, it requires considerable thought. It's not that a, a peer devotee just reacts automatically, but there's a process that one goes through. You have to think about it. What's actually happening to me? Who's the cause of this action? And we see throughout the Bhagavatam this takes place. In the first canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, when Tarma, the bull, and Bhumi in the form of a cow have been, uh, they were preaching Maharaj, discovered them along the way, along, his road, along the roadway, and seen that they'd been beaten. And he asked them, you know, who did this and so forth. And there's a lot of consideration about who could have done this. Even though it was kind of obvious, Kali had done it, Dharma wouldn't admit, he wouldn't say, he did this to me. Mm -hmm. He gave a very philosophical answer, and it's mentioned by. Uh, shall I I'll just read the, the verse to you because this will you'll be stunned when you hear this. We may not be able to finish the class after you hear this verse. Did you mark it? Bookmark. Oh, this is the bookmark. There's two, right? It's the first bookmark. But there's two. 117.22. The king said, O oh, you who are in the form of a bull, this Prichit Maharaj speaking to the bull after the bull refuses to name Kali as the one who heard him. You know the truth of religion and you are speaking according to the principle that the destination intended for the perpetrator of irreligious acts is also intended for one who identifies the perpetrator. You are no other than the personality of religion. You're stunned. I better read it again. The king said, O oh, you who are in the form of a bull, you know the truth of religion, and you are speaking according to the principle that the destination intended for the perpetrator of irreligious acts is also intended for one who identifies the perpetrator. You are no other than the personality of religion. This goes toward the understanding that Yadrishchaya, this has come from providence, and one who then becomes the claims to be that I am the victim. Uh, becomes, uh, is culpable also for the same sin. Signing on to the karma. Peter Burwash tells the story over and over again about how he was just becoming involved with ISKCON, became enthusiastic to donate money, and he gave at the Hawaii temple um, whatever the requisite amount was to become a life member. I think it was $1,008, which was a lot of money back then in the 1970s. And then the person who took the money from him took the money. And he absconded just after receiving it, he used it for an airplane ticket and a milkshake, probably. And took off somewhere with the money and just disappeared. And Prabhupada happened to be there at the time, so Peter Brorish went to Prabhupada and complained. Among other things, Prabhupada said, do not be disturbed with the agent of your karma. And he takes that as one of the foundational points 
in his life, do not be disturbed with the agent of your karma. So this is a similar mentality for the uh, teaching that Dharma is giving when not naming the perpetrator, not becoming a victim. And in a similar way, Gajendra here is making this intelligent decision, says he intelligently arrived at this, and that Dadao means he began to think very seriously about this, and then Putin means he made a decision, an intelligent decision, he reached it. So now, having reached that decision, I have more evidence to enter in before the court this morning regarding this verse, which is two sentences offered by Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur in talking about this verse. And he says, Gajendra thought, this is my karma. When he thought in that way, he suddenly got intelligence. He thought, this is my karma. When he thought in that way, he suddenly got intelligence. <clears throat> so we were just thinking a while ago about how is it that one gets intelligence when one sees things correctly, makes the correct decision, and understands or decides to not become the victim, but to take this, whatever circumstance it is, as coming from providence, from the mercy of the Lord. Any thoughts about why that happens? That the moment he decided that this is my karma, and he accepted it, that he got intelligence what to do. Madhukari. That's what Siri calls him. Well, Krishna, Krishna says that intelligence comes from him. Hold that right next to your mouth. Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita that he's the source of, of uh, intelligence. Can you please sing out the verse in a beautiful voice? Oh, Buddha, Buddha, Matamasmi. He says, I'm the intelligence of the intelligence. I'm the intelligence that tells you another verse where Krishna says he provides intelligence. Two more verses. Go ahead. Sanskrit, English, Bengali, whatever you like. But speak it into the microphone because there are others. He, he says he's the source of all knowledge and utterance and forgetfulness. Okay, all together, everyone sing the verse. <laughs> Another one? Please. Another verse where Krishna says he gives intelligence right up here to our pundit in the front row. All together. You give the meaning of the verse. To those who are constantly devoted to serving me with love, I give the intelligence by which they can come to me. And now give some personal experience of the verse, the realization you've had about that. Okay, um, well, when I was um, seeking after the Supreme, um, Age 16, 17, beginning my um, universal study of spiritual culture, um, I was led to the Hare Krishna temple and I was given the Hare Krishna mantra. And I uh, always found uh, that chanting Hare Krishna um, really transformed my consciousness and my experiences and uh, seemed to attract you know, kind of divine sort of experiences. And, uh, but um, one day I was just chanting Hare Krishna and reading, reading Bhagavad Gita praying very intently, you know, uh, you know, worshiping the Lord from my heart and praying. And, uh, and Krishna gave me intelligence that day that, uh, that I, I should devote myself full time to, to serving, you know, in, in this common movement. You know, I could, I could finally understand, you know. Uh, so I, I, I knew Krishna gave me that intelligence and, uh, and that was because of my sincere desire to serve him. 
Would you be interested in hearing some of the symptoms of victim mentality? Yes. You want to hear it? Yes. Okay. The tendency to focus on the bad rather than the good. The tendency to focus on the bad rather than the good. To blaming others for a situation that one has created oneself. Blaming others for a situation that one has created oneself. Ascribing non-existence negative intentions to other people. Ascribing non-existent negative intentions to other people. And believing that other people are generally are luckier or happier than me, and therefore the phrase, why me? And getting pleasure from feeling sorry for oneself, or eliciting pity from others, usually by telling exaggerated stories about what other people have done to you. Did any of that sound familiar? Yes? If you get really extreme, then use the mic. I was talking that um, there's actually people that they get so much pleasure from the self pity from, or the pity from others that they go as far as um, killing someone in their family. So there's a funeral. And that's why they created a law that if a child dies from SIDS, more than in a family, more than like two children die, then they investigate because there's a chance that they're being killed by the parent, so that the person Why can get, the parent kill? They get they get negative they get that sympathy in a negative form. I see. Yeah, and they thrive on that. And I thought that was really strange. That that is really strange. <laughs> Show me a promise. I was just thinking that one of the symptoms of a victim mentality is the tendency to file lawsuits. And the, and the proliferation of that in our culture is kind of... I mean, yes, yeah. very much so. I remember talking to my brother-in-law once about this. He had studied a lot about victimhood, victimology and so forth. And I had mentioned something about a lawsuit and he was saying, this is all part of the mentality that's developed from this being a victim. That any little thing that happens, you blame someone else and try to sue them and so forth. And then you have the Sue me, sue you, blues. <laughs> Any other points? Okay, now we'll take some reflections. Any one thing that you heard from the verse purported discussion so far that's stuck in your mind? Someone said to me a long time ago, which always helps me in situations of processing things like that, is that uh, time and mercy can change anything. Time and mercy. If you give enough time and you pray for mercy, you pray for some light when it comes to this to help heal the heart, then that can help. Sometimes it's not, it's not an intellectual adjustment. You can't just suddenly give it up. But if you give some time and tolerate it, as toleration is very powerful, as you let time go by, and you also pray to Krishna to help change your heart, then it's possible to overcome such things. And I recommend that as a means to do that. Otherwise, 
an intellectual process may not be so helpful. We're doing reflections. Any one thing that you heard, and hopefully you heard at least one thing that stuck, just recount. The point about, um, I think it was in the purport, once one recognizes that it's their karma, then intelligence awakens? Yes, that was from Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur, who said that, yes, I'll repeat it, because I heard a few oohs and ahs in the audience when I read this. Gajendra thought, this is my karma. When he thought in that way, he suddenly got intelligence. So I was just thinking how that kind of self-examination, it's an opportunity to connect with super soul. Chaitanya Guru, and for the sadhaka, at least for any spiritual practitioner, that's really an important part as far as the inner life. And without that, then we may externally be performing sadhana or rituals or the form of the particular practice, but it's until that point that we're actually, it's at that point that we're actually making that connection soul to super soul and, uh, and then this sense of substance to it. So if I understand you correctly, you're defining this decision. Instead of ascribing blame to any external cause, you accept it as coming from providence and because of that you're able to turn inwardly and it relates to Madhukari's statement and at that time you're connecting more intimately with super soul and you get intelligence. It's kind of a barometer if we're on the spiritual platform or not. It's, it's pretty much... When you say it, what do you mean? Can you unpack that, 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 that? And hold the microphone just a little bit. That, um, that state of consciousness that Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur is expressing, it's really a barometer throughout the day of whether we're on the platform of, of what he's talking about as far as internalizing, self-examining, or if we're not. It's, and throughout the day, there's numerous chapters of how we're reacting to certain situations and external, whether it's animate or inanimate objects, and putting the blame on that. And so it's, it's just for the sadhaka, it's a constant process throughout, more practically moment to moment, just because of our tendency to either blame the environment or to introspect and see, okay, how is this uh, coming to me because of my karma? And that nice. Process. I want to read a verse, enter into evidence, something, a way in which the Avanti Brahman, Brahmana was processing his misery in life. The Avanti Brahmana was a rich landholder, but because he was a miser and held back his resources, the demigods forsake him, also his relatives, and he lost all his money, he lost all his crops, and everyone walked away from him. And suddenly, in that state of complete loss, he had a revelation that this was the Lord's mercy. And he took sannyas and he began wandering the countryside in search of the Lord <clears throat> and performing his, his bhajan. And everywhere he went, people abused him. And sometimes they'd tie him up and they'd beat him. Sometimes people would spit on him. Sometimes when he was about to eat, they'd contaminate the food he was about to eat. They'd say, oh, look at this great sannyasi. He's very peaceful, just like a duck. And make all kinds of uh, insults to him. And in the course of this, he remarks, If you say that these people are the cause of my happiness and distress, then where is the place of the soul in such a conception? This happiness and distress pertain not to the soul, but to the interactions of material bodies. If someone bites his tongue with his own teeth, at whom can he become angry in his suffering? <laughs> I've always appreciated that example. So sometimes people will be chewing or I'm chewing, and I accidentally bite my tongue in it. 
damn you, who? <laughs> and so he astutely compares this experience in the material world, this kind of suffering that uh, everything that's happened to me is interconnected with the things that I've done before. So it's, it's a kind of, as Sri Dhanu often says, a kind of cosmic sensitivity training that I'm getting. And for that, I'd like to read from the 10th canto, 14th chapter. <coughs> and the purport to the verse, Tate Anukampam Susamikshamano, which never becomes stale, and which describes the situation of somebody who's become a devotee, but then is still suffering. Does that sound familiar? Or is it just me? Should I read it? Yes. yes. But not very enthusiastically. <laughs> I should read it in sort of a morose tone. Chap uh, Canto 10, Chapter 14, Text Number 8. Brahma is speaking. He says, My dear Lord, one who earnestly waits for you to bestow your causeless mercy upon him, all the while patiently suffering the reactions of his past misdeeds and offering you respectful obeisances with his heart, words, and body is surely eligible for liberation, for it has become his rightful claim. Are you ready for the purport? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. yes. Be rapturous in your hearing. Rapt attention. Try to drink this in with your ears. Srila Sridhar Swami explains in his commentary that just as a legitimate son has to simply remain alive to gain an inheritance from his father, one who simply remains alive in Krishna consciousness following the regulative principles of Bhakti Yoga automatically becomes eligible to receive the mercy of the Personality of Godhead. In other words, he will be promoted to the Kingdom of God. The word Susamikshamana indicates that a devotee earnestly awaits the mercy of the Supreme Lord even while suffering the painful effects of previous sinful activities. Lord Krishna explains in Bhagavad Gita that a devotee who fully surrenders unto him is no longer liable to suffer the reactions of his previous karma. However, because in his mind, the devotee may still maintain the remnants of his previous sinful mentality, the Lord removes the last vestiges of the enjoying spirit by giving his devotee punishments that may sometimes resemble sinful reactions. The purpose of the entire creation of God is to rectify the living entity's <coughs> tendency to enjoy without the Lord. And therefore the particular punishment given for a sinful activity is specifically designed to curtail the mentality that produced the activity. Although a devotee has surrendered to the Lord's devotional service, until he is completely perfect in Krishna consciousness, he may maintain a slight inclination to enjoy the false happiness of this world. The Lord therefore creates a particular situation to eradicate this remaining enjoying spirit. This unhappiness suffered by a sincere devotee is not technically a karmic reaction. It is rather the Lord's special mercy for inducing his devotee to completely let go of the material world and return home back to Godhead. I heard the other day in a uh, radio interview, uh, the interviewee had been corrected for something that he said, and then the interviewer apologized, because it, it was a venerable person he was interviewing, but for the sake of the radio audience, he wanted to make sure he corrected what the person had mistakenly said. And the interviewee said, I live to be corrected. Can you repeat that mantra, please? So homework today is to use that at least once today. I live to be corrected. And this is the mentality portrayed in this verse and of Gajendra, and which actually allows the Lord's grace to descend and the intelligence to come into one's heart. This mantra, I live to be corrected. That is seeing the universe as, and everything that happens within the universe as an opportunity for coming to the perfect stage of <clears throat> thinking of Krishna constantly. And the enjoying spirit which obstructs that is remedied by the 
sufferings and different seeming reactions that we get, which are actually the Lord's particular and special mercy. Yes, Mataji? It all seems well and ideal to have that uh, mentality not identifying who's uh, tormenting us and, um, you know, just being tolerant and accepting that whatever it is is an instrument of our karma. And this is all nice, you know, like promising in the next life, you know, you get the mercy of Krishna and the reward and so on. But in like the present situation, how's that uh, attitude of just being so tolerant and passive, how's that going to help uh, the person and the uh, quote unquote perpetrator? Because punishment has a, a place, a function, right? Krishna, he um, employs punishment too. How can uh, the state of order be maintained? And uh, sometimes one might strive to be tolerant and, um, you know, like, humble or surrender to Krishna, this is my karma, uh, might make that effort, that sacrifice in the mind, but inside you're not feeling that sense of closure there. Well, that sounds like two two-part question, but the first part is how will the perpetrator be dealt with, and we'll notice in the story of Dharma the bull, that it's not that the perpetrator was led to walk free. Kali had beaten the bull and cow, and Parikshit Maharaj, who was the proper agent to deal with him, dealt with him. And he was about to kill him. But he gave him due process. There was due process available at that time. So instead of just slicing off his head, because Kali had surrendered to Parikshit Maharaj and said, I'm surrendering unto you, now you have to save me, he gave him a, a sentence which was that you have to leave and you can't come back here. You can only come to places where there is um, any of the sinful activities. And Kali complained, he said, there is no place like that. So then he gave him a concession, he said, wherever people are hoarding gold, you can come to that place and reside and so forth. But the point is, there's an appointed agent to deal with the situation for instance, Yamaraj is also an appointed agent. He does his duty for the Lord, and he punishes the sinful. If you read in the fifth canto, you find out that there's a particular hell. There's many different kinds of hell, which particularly address the sinful activity of the person, uh, of a particular sin that the person commits. So uh, Krishna is the perfect moral agent. It's not that there's uh, any arbitrary to the universe, it's actually uh, justice is perfectly administered here. So when karma and punishment comes, it is completely taken care of, and this is one of the uh, bases for understanding or taking this position that uh, not to uh, to self-administer the punishment to somebody unless you're appointed in that way. Understanding that there is a a, a way in which the, uh, there are certain agents that are meant to take care of it. And also in the universe, universal, I mean, oftentimes people just in regular course of life, when something happens, they'll forgive the person because they'll say, well, that's their karma to deal with anyway. They have, it'll come back to them. Because people intuitively know, these, especially pious people, that these things will be dealt with uh, with equal measure. And the second part of your question is how do you deal with it internally when you've been a victim, when, you've, when somebody's uh, done something wrong to you? And part of, it, part of the answer is philosophically. Because whenever something happens to us in this world that uh, some kind of a reversal, the only way we really can first deal with it is philosophically. For instance, your car gets hit. You buy a new car, you're really proud of your car, you're really happy about your car, you can't wake up, wait to wake up in the morning and see it 
and touch it and polish it and everything like that. And then you take it out on the first day and then a big truck comes and smashes your car. And then what do you do? You become philosophical. Well, you know, or somebody else does on your behalf. You know, it's just a car after work. After all, that's philosophy. Or somebody leaves you and some, someone will come along and say, well, you know, there's other people in the world and they take a, a higher vantage point and try to give you philosophy. So the highest vantage point is being presented here philosophically. You can't go any higher than this and just say, it's all happening because of the arrangement of the Supreme Personality of God. And inherent in that is the understanding that it will be dealt with perfectly and morally, because Krishna is the perfect moral agent. But on a personal level, yes, there's processing to be done. In other words, it may not be just because you philosophically understand it that now I'm okay. So I mentioned there's also time and mercy. And there's also ways in which you can talk to other people who have been victims of the same kind of uh, crime. And then there's lots of groups, you know, support groups. You need to get support. Like people who have, you know, had a murder in their family. There are actually groups for people who have had murders in their family. And they get together. And for the interim, before they're able to deal with it, uh, you know, in a more philosophical way, they can talk to other people and have support and learn how to day to day get along with their get along with their lives without imploding because of the misery of the situation and so forth. And to that end, there are all kinds of rituals in society through which we deal with these kinds of reversals so that well, we can come together with people and have some closure and then try to move on in a natural way. These are all uh, part of the hard struggle for existence in the material world and one has to have various devices to deal with them. So we thank, yes, last point. Uh, <clears throat> reflection, uh, I like that consideration you told in the class of like, it's not like immediately you do, but you, there is a time of consideration, like how Gajendra considered his position. And also, um, I like the example that you have given on Dharma, the Buddha, like how he was not, he was trying to not think that it is his fault and he was trying to philosophize his things so that he is not in the uh, mental right uh, to find the victim. So that was very, uh, I always like the Bhagavatam has so much practical lessons and it helps us uh, when we are in that situation to put us in place and we can get more. It's a practical level of this idea of forgiving and letting things go. Is uh, It actually works a lot better than trying to attach blame everywhere you go. I just, I mean, in incidental cases, I noticed I was walking once in O'Hare Airport and I saw two businessmen. I saw the whole scenario unfold as they were walking both with briefcases swinging and both were looking at a cell phone and just as they were walking down the hallway, ne neither of them looking where they were going, they, they clipped each other. Clip. And both of them were thrown off balance a little bit. And each of them turned around and began to berate the other one for, why don't you watch where you're going? <laughs> and I, I have a mantra when, you know, when people bump into me or something like that, even if it was apparently their fault, I would say, sorry, my fault. And it, it just, relieves the situation almost instantly. That uh, it's a way to move in the world by releasing people. Otherwise, it's yours to own. You can own it the rest of the day. Like those people probably on the, they got on the plane and started talking about, the guy bumped into me. And now he's got to deal with it for the rest of his life. But if you just turn around and say, I release you, you know, it was my fault, sorry, you know, and just move on. It's a lot easier, also driving in a car and so forth. <laughs> and you can escalate that to, to other situations that happen in, in your life. That if, if you're quick to forgive, then you don't have to carry it for the rest of your life. It's a much better policy. And the last verse I'm just going to read as a close, which seals the, which gives evidence for what I just said. is found in the first canto, 18th chapter, 48th verse. This chapter is called Preach It, Cursed by a Brahmin Boy. 
Nothing worse than that. A little punk cursing you. <laughs> and now you gotta die in seven days. I mean, that's pain. And this is, this is in response to that in this chapter. This epitomizes the mood of this chapter. The devotees of the Lord are so forbearing that even though they are defamed, cheated, cursed, disturbed, neglected, or even killed, they are never inclined to avenge themselves. Om Tat Sat. I rest my case. Vancha Kalpadrupasha, Kripasindadehimacha, Patitanam Bhavanidyo, Vaishnadehyo, Tumonamaha. And now we have a thing. Were you aware of that? If you are aware of that, that means you've read this chart. It means you, don't, you can't have one. <laughs> and in which case, I have for you a beautiful shloka about Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. They're all mixed, they're different shlokas. So if you already have one of these charts, don't take another one, because I only have a limited amount. And you can have one of these beautiful verses. I'll read you a sample. Let me first offer my respectful obeisances unto Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu as the ultimate goal of life for one bereft of all possessions in this material world. And is the only meaning for one advancing in spiritual life. L thus let me write about his magnan magnanimous contribution of devotional service and love of God. Haribo. And if that wasn't enough, <laughs> I have, for those of you who uh, go on Sankirtan or just teach Krishna consciousness to others, I have written on this tiny little card one of the uh, purposes of ISKCON. And if all else fails, read the manual. This is the pur one of the main purposes of ISKCON. And I found this to be an excellent way to ask for a donation when you distribute a book. You hand them, after you explain the book, and you say, now we ask for a donation, and here's what we're doing with the money. And you say, we are systematically propagating spiritual knowledge to society at large to educate all people in the techniques of spiritual life in order to check the imbalance of values in life and to achieve real unity and peace in the world. And they can't reach for their wallet or credit card fast enough when they hear that because that's what everyone would like to do with their hard-earned money. So you can also have one of these little uh, cards to carry in your wallet or purse, and you can pull it out at any time. Okay? Yeah. So please come up, and I'll give you either a shloka or a chart in one of these um, purposes of not to the Armarman, not to the Armarman, not to the Armarman, hey, not to the Armarman, not to the Armarman, not to the Armarman, not to the Armarman.